last we spoke, you were not sure if you were going to get a chance to walk in space. And it happened. It happened. Yep. And I just remember that moment of seeing it on our thermal camera and like we are arriving at the International Space Station. You hear this fan noise like, and that's it. That's the only noise you hear. And you're looking down as you fly five miles per second across the surface of the Earth. That sent chills down my spine. Woody, welcome back to Planet Earth. Thank you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm the one to be welcoming you, welcoming you, but um, I'm so stoked that you're here at the Mastery Lab, and this is awesome to reconnect. It's it's so good to be back. We were just saying I was here just under a year ago, literally months before my well, almost one month before my launch, mm -hmm. and now I've been back for a few months. I feel like I've been running at full pace through all of it, through the mission, getting back, and it's. I'm excited today because we'll get a chance to probably deep dive. I'm sure you'll make me uncomfortable, as you always do. <laughs> so <laughs> out of I'm, love, I'm really my friend, <laughs> out of love. Um, okay, so let's just start kind of at the top. Like, how are you? Wide open question, but like, how are you today? I'm great. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to do a mission up to the space station. It was a unique life experience, the very best kind. I had a great time. Um, I had three goals when uh, I embarked on my mission. Yep. My goals were to be safe, to have fun, and to come back as friends with my crew. And I think I accomplished all three. I couldn't be happier. I didn't know that last one, or I had forgotten it if we talked about it. And it's so plainly said that in the, the weight underneath of that, I was wanting to ask you about like the team and the relationships and like what happened up there. Specifically, what makes a great team in a high-pressured, high-stress environment? And I, so we're going to drill into that a little bit. Yeah. But this, the simplicity is like, I wanted to be friends with these, these people that I had a life-changing, maybe, I'm, I'm adding. I don't know if it's life-changing or not for you. I do not want to add that. But the, this very unique experience that I had. Okay, awesome. So uh, the other things I want to talk about is um, your reentry. I want to I want to understand some insights that maybe you've had, and you know, just in general, um, any ways that you might be different. Okay, so those are kind of the three main buckets that I want to talk about. Okay, let's go reentry first. And so reentry. When we talk about reentry, we we mean that dynamic phase of flight from being in orbit to literally reentering Earth's atmosphere, slowing down from 17,500 miles an hour to zero and splashing down in the ocean. That's re-entry for us. And is that what you mean? Or you mean a broader? I, I mean, I think I mean both here. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm interested in what you just said. <laughs> I'm more interested in the re-entry um, back into civilian type life. And I don't even know if that's the right phrasing, but back the re-entry back into living on earth. And that's uh, more of an emotional, a social, a relational, uh, and a physical uh, thing that I'm, I'm interested in. And yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why I'm interested in that. Um, and we're kind of starting in reverse order from, from re-entry. And Great. then we're going to go back to like some of the takeoff stuff, like what happened before takeoff. So we're going to go in reverse order in the conversation. Great. And there's a reason for that. But when I, I travel a bunch and I learned from some scar tissue and some hard times that if I'm gone for an ex two weekends in a row, so let's call it, you know, seven days would be a full week and then add a couple more days. So it's like a 10 day trip. Of course, my relationship is fine, right? Like no, no issues. We're good. We have a really strong base. And I'm talking about my relationship with my wife. Mm -hmm. We've been best friends since we were 16 years old, really great depth there. And then, but if I do a 10 day, two weekends, basically, and I do a, one or two or three of those that are kind of stacked back to back, we we lose some connection. It's not that it's like uh, even noticeable, but it it sh because we're again the base is so rich and good. But when I re-enter back into the home, she's got some hopes of how maybe I'll show up or what I'll do, and you know there's a bunch of things that maybe need to get 
done that have slipped at the, on the household front. And there's some hopes and things that I have for her and like of how maybe she'll engage. So we, we actually did a bunch of work on reentry and to, to be able to just take the air out of it and not have um, a hope even of how somebody else is going to show up, but just to be kind of present in the way that we're reentering and then to check in with each other was our process. And it's been very important for us. And so I'm setting this up because personally, I want to learn how you reentered and if it was um, painful, if it was good, if it was, you know, good, if it was hard, if it was wonderful, like, let me just open up reentry uh, on that part before we go to the, to the technical parts of it. Great. Uh, well, I feel very fortunate. I have friends and loved ones in my life who I think, I think of them as just there for me, no matter what. And that for me feels very true, independent of the duration of time that I've not been in touch with them or whatever it is. Um, so very concretely, like my mom and brother were actually there at Ellington Field in Houston, Texas, when I landed. We we take a after we splash down in the ocean, which we'll talk about later, we fly on a helicopter to Florida. We do a couple tests and then we fly on an airplane to Houston, Texas. And that is so this is hours after splashdown, hours after I got back to Earth. And before I even got off the airplane, my mom and brother got on board and got to come just have a small personal moment and say hi. And that meant so much to me to have them there. It just brought just, me so much joy knowing I that- I just felt it when you said it. Did, <laughs> did you feel it too? <laughs> Not as I was talking, but- <laughs> I, I don't believe you. I just saw it. So I just felt and saw what you, you know, so that's all, like, you didn't feel like the, the little gulp in your- We were talking earlier about chills on your spine. I yeah. assume that's what you're referring to here. Okay, so so I don't want to distract it. So So she was there. Your your brother was there. And I think this mission, it's a six-month mission. It's kind of a series of launching into the unknown in many different ways. And the very last segment of launching into the un unknown is actually coming home. I've been on the space station for six months. I know what that is like. But that last day where we return home is a, is a yet another step of just somewhat unknown. We've done a lot of training. But... What the experience will really be like is still a bit of a mystery until you actually do it. And I think knowing that at the end of all that, no matter how I knew I might feel sick or I might feel just out of it or worked physically. From but, from the impact of, not the impact, but from the conditions of reentry, yeah, like and the we can, technical part. The it. technical part. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it, but neurovestibular stuff. Uh, people get sick and it's hard. It's physically pretty hard coming back. But I knew at the end of all of that, that my mom was going to come onto the airplane and say hi. And so that for me was Even just if like you were a, a disaster. Yep. Yeah, right? Didn't matter. Yeah, right. Of course. And I, so that for me was just this comforting knowledge that at the end of this process I was embarking on, um, there would be someone I really cared about, two people, my mom and brother would be there, yeah, be there for me. me. And then- you know, also my my good guy friends were kind of there for me throughout my mission. I did some uh, video chats with them, mm -hmm. and um, that's another aspect where people that are important to me in my life were part of my mission in that way. We couldn't meet up pers in person, yeah. but uh, we just made the most of the situation. And so I felt very happy with all those relationships. And there's also, an, it's just such a unique si uh, situation yeah. that I didn't, it's kind of fun. You're coming back from this ridiculous situation. And yeah, you might be a little out of touch, but that's kind of fun. That's part of the whole thing. <laughs> well, it, that's your framing of it. So other people could have a very different framing, you know, but that's uniquely yours, which is like, it's ridiculous <laughs> and it's fun, you know? And what you're doing is you're framing and shaping the unknown. And so I don't, it's almost worth repeating how you, what you just did. So the framing of embarking on the unknown is one framing. And then the ridiculousness of what I did or got to do. And like, those are two framings that are materially important in your own psychology. So the first is embarking on the unknown. This moment is unknown. I don't know what I'm about to say, really <laughs> what you're about to say, I have no idea. You and I have never been here. So in my mind, I'm framing each moment as the unknown. So there's an emblem that we can kind of hook around 
that you're the emblem for the un- exploring the unknown, but it's always available right now. Mm-hmm. Here. That's fine. And that is a, a mystery of how this next moment is going to interlock. And so, um, so that, that, that piece that you're just highlighting that is really important because you're, you're talking about the ridiculousness of life it, to me. You're using it framing for the, the uh, being outer space. Why do I say ridiculousness? I'm living in this body. I don't know how that happened. You're living in your body. I'm not sure really how this thing really happens. Um, we're using language that we've made up. This is all made up, okay? <laughs> we think we're in this reality, but it's probably not actually how it's really happening. We know that there's more colors in the spectrum mm. than we can actually see. There's more sounds, certainly with my hearing. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. more experiences that that are um, in reality taking place than we can uh, understand and even embrace. So it's ridiculous. This whole thing <laughs> is is ridiculous. And you framing it as, isn't that fun? <laughs> Woody, I've said repeatedly, I think you're the best of us. And I mean that in every sense. And so to hear you frame it as ridiculous and fun, I just fall in love with the way that you work. And so I, I'm inspired by that. And I'm not saying that lightly, but ridiculousness. Yes, this too is ridiculous, <laughs> right? Like made up language. What do you really want? What do you really, 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 really want? You've gone to outer space. You've had a spacewalk. You've lived this radical life carving your unique path. Even when the world said, don't go this way. The experts said, I don't think you're going to get to where you want to go by going in in, in the rescue adventure, Mm -hmm. uh, rescue, what's it called? Search and rescue. Search and rescue way. Mm -hmm. You know, like, Woody, what do you really, 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 really want from your time here? I feel very lucky in many senses. I'm lucky, like you said, to inhabit this body. I'm lucky to have been born into a loving, caring family. I'm lucky to have gone, been uh, grown up in an amazing public school system, to have been surrounded by mentors that believed in me. So I've been lucky throughout much of life. Uh, I was lucky even over the last year with the opportunities that were presented with me, for example, getting to do a spacewalk. You know, that's part of it is were you trained and prepared and capable? But we have a lot of people that are trained and prepared and capable that don't have that opportunity just because of things that come up. We down the suits for a little while because um, there's technical issues. While you're up there? That could happen. That That has happened in the past. So it is not a done deal. Meaning you were ready and prepared and you were were tapped to be the one, somebody, not you. Right. And the suit was having a weird thing. So you didn't get the opportunity. So I feel so lucky. To have had the opportunities so that's a framing that I've had. You feel lucky in this in your life? Yes. I don't see you that way. That's so interesting. I feel well, and I'll get to your question because maybe this ties in. Yeah. So I feel very fortunate to have had these opportunities. Well, fortune and, and lucky then, are different. Okay. Why why do you use lucky? Maybe fortunate is a better word. Okay. But I feel I feel that there were aspects of my wait, success wait, wait, that did I, I didn't... just shape your thought. I don't want to do that. Sh- I just wanted to understand more. Okay. What like I I see you as highly prepared, skilled, thoughtful, organized, intentional, putting yourself in places that you want to be. And yes, we don't know why the ball bounces this way or that way, mm-hmm. but it feels like you're so skilled and agile psychologically, physically, technically, that when the ball does bounce or break the way that it's, we don't think it is, that you're able to be agile enough to pick it up and work with it. And I see that as like radical commitment to mastery. That's great because that's uh, that's exactly where I wanted to take it. Okay. So you asked, like, what do I want? I said, yeah. really, like eight times. <laughs> <laughs> what like, do you really, 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 want? really, really want? I think what I really want yeah. is when I'm so fortunate to have whatever opportunities I have yep. to do my very best with those opportunities. That, I think, brings great fulfillment. Okay. When I look back and think, yeah. what are the times when I was not happy with myself? It's when the ball dribbled my way and I either didn't pick it up or I picked it up and did something silly with it or 
um, it's to take those opportunities and run with them. What do you really, 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 really want is to do my very best. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's open that up. It's a phrase that gets thrown around like easily, like I'm doing my best or I just want to do my best or I'm trying my best or I did my best. And you're taking that as a bit of a life philosophy, not as a metric of success, but like a mm. philosophy, like I'm working to be my very best. That's how I want to do my life, mm -hmm. right? To, to do my very best. So how do you, let's like, if we open the aperture of that and we, we, I, I was able to somehow understand the material that's inside how you work, wh what does that mean to you? How do you know if you're doing your very best and what does that feel like when you're doing your very best? And then I'm going to go one step further. What are the thoughts that give you that feeling? And then the evaluation is like, how do you know? So let's start with the thoughts. What are the thoughts that help you be your very best? I'm actually glad to start there because that's I'm not sure that I have the tools to completely frame what I mean by that. But I think thoughts is a is one that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. So I think what doing my best looks like is I have some thought like there's an there's two options I have here and one seems easy and one seems hard. And I kind of know that I should do the hard one, but it seems hard. And doing my best means actually doing that. And it feels like in many moments, you know, life is kind of a series of doing the next thing, t taking the next moment. Like you said, yep. we don't know literally what's going to happen one minute from now. But um, I think doing my best means when there are two options and I know that one is better than the other, but is uncomfortable or hard or um, I just don't feel like it or whatever it is saying, nope, that's the right thing to do right now. I don't know if you'll remember this, but a year ago, I asked you that question. I don't remember. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And the, and I usually, I'm actually quite impressed with myself right now that I remember this, <laughs> but it's because I've repeated it to myself and many other people. Often I've cited you, which is um, that idea of how do you do your best? And you very reflexively said, I'm not sure I know the answer. Similar position, okay. posture as you just took. And you said, I, I just, and I should play back the tape to get the accuracy of it as if we're using tape. I just dated myself to like 1980, <laughs> right? But play that back, which is, um, I don't know. It's, I just, I make the decisions at a moment's time that are leaning me towards, you know, what I think is the best for me. It's, I think you use the word micro choices or mm. it's just little choices that I continually make. It's that type of framing. That sounds consistent, right? Yep. Yeah. And if we're concrete for a minute, it's like, uh, apple pie or apple apple <laughs> okay and there's times you eat apple pie absolutely okay and i don't think there's anyone in our community that doesn't know that an apple is healthy and an apple pie is suspect for health, <laughs> right <laughs> it doesn't mean don't eat an apple pie it just means know what you're doing okay good i like apple pie by the way and so um now now waking up early and going to the gym if you want to be a morning workout person versus getting um an eighth hour of sleep both are good. So how do you do that? Yeah, I like that. I don't, uh, I don't know that I stress about that too much. I, I'm going to make up that you listen in some way to yourself to make that decision. I think that's right. I, you're an active, you're an active person in life. Yeah. I don't mean physically. But, I mean, but active, like in your awareness and you're not just like, ah, whatever the universe has for me, I'm you know, I don't know. It's like you're, I think you're, you're making an active choice in that moment. Yes. Okay. I like being in situations in like life and work where I have to choose between what you do. getting enough sleep or working out. That means that I'm probably doing something interesting to me that's taking up my time that I find relevant and fulfilling. And so hmm. I think I'm happy when I get forced to make that hard decision. Yeah. And that doesn't quite feel to me like, well, one of these is good and one is bad. And I think it's just in the moment, okay, I haven't worked out for a couple of days, so I'm going to get up and work out. Or I haven't slept for a few days and I really need to sleep and I know that's what's going to be better for Got me. Got it. So you're taking an inventory. So you make decisions yeah. based on like an inventory about history and state. 
Yep. Does that make sense? That makes Relative sense to, to um, who you want to be and become, whether that's a small mission or life mission. Like, does that make sense? Inventory, yep. History inventory mapped up against what I'm trying to do. Yep. Okay. Trade off. Maybe you're pinched on something. You can't have it. You can't have everything. Mm. Can't have all the. Uh, you've only got 24 hours in the day. Right. So trade off what's most important right now. Okay. And then now let's go one more framing to keep it concrete. Um, the micro choices is what we're talking about. And if you stacked a bunch of micro choices together that um, created a sense about yourself. Okay. So I'm purposely leaving that blank. Actually, I'll just say it is that at the end of the day, if you've got some buoyancy and you've got like um, a fullness about you, you've probably made a bunch of micro choices that have led to a, a feeling of being animated and alive. And like, I, I was, I was my best today. I was really on it, you know? So now, now let's make, be very concrete about the way that you speak to yourself because you've got a micro choice there as well. And there's thousands mm -hmm. of micro choices a day about, do I say, what the fuck is wrong with me? Or do I say, well, that's really curious. I'm really curious, like, well, why did I respond that way? Or do I say, oh, that's a good piece of information. Like, I'm going to learn from that. So that's a micro choice of three things I could say if something didn't go well. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with me? Self-critical and judgmental. Um, uh, to kind of agnostic as a learner, uh, the other two, but there's just different tones. Learner versus critical. How do you, how do you work there at that level? Specifically when things go wrong? Yeah, when things think, aren't going according to like the way we hoped. I have always been, I think, quite self-critical. Mm. And that may be a bit of a crutch. I think it's done good things for me, but I've, I've always been quite self-critical. What does that sound like? What it sounds like for me is probably, I don't think it's negative. I do think I have a positive framing on it, but I think it's fairly practical. It's that didn't go the way I wanted it to. I need to do better next time. Does that sound judgmental or critical? I'm not sure I know the difference. Okay. Uh, I actually didn't hear, I heard, I heard neither positive or negative. Yeah. I, I heard um, more tactical. Yeah. Like you're not creating a, a micro tear and you're not trying to fluff up something favorable, positive, like, oh, you're good. You'll get it next time. I don't hear that in you. And I don't hear, man, what is wrong? You're never going to get this. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's a more um, tactical approach to it okay i like playing games where i'm the un where i'm not as good as my opponent oh like, like, like what does that mean for me that's addictive because i'm like eventually i'm gonna <laughs> eventually i'll get my skills oh, together so you, so eventually you're... i'll i'll figure this out okay but, so you're competitive <laughs> a bit <laughs> <laughs> a bit was that a joke like yeah i'm really obnoxiously competitive or like no i'm no, I'm uh, just kind of competitive. I think only uh, in things that I care about. Okay. But I Are think you, I'm mostly competitive with myself. I was going to go competitive against others, competitive with others. I see it as competing with myself. Yeah. So that's the way I did the with. Like we're together mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. and, and I love that we're kind of both in a competitive spirit and I'm bringing my best, dude. <laughs> right? Like that. And so like I'm not trying to be better than you and step – like the, the – I love Muhammad Ali for so much of what he did. And I know he's really polarizing mm. um, in some communities and revered in others, and which I love just that, that radicalness that some people boo and some people applaud. Like, I love that. But that picture of him standing over celebrating the, his opponent being knocked out or knocked down, I see myself in that type mm. of aggressiveness, and I don't like it. I don't mm. want it. I don't want that in my life now. And so I don't feel like that's the spirit that you have in it. Nope. Did you ever? I, nope. No, that's not kind of the way that you're made up. So when you think about being competitive with yourself, what does that mean? It just means that I see that I could do better. And, and then how do you speak to yourself in that micro choice? I just say, I hope I have another chance to try that again. Okay, so you and I are playing chess. Yep. And it's an off day for me, and I got really lucky. <laughs> your, your big brain <laughs> made some. <laughs> so, okay, so we're playing chess, and I got you on this one. And then you say, ah, 
you don't you don't cut yourself like oh man i got i got beat by the little mind of mike <laughs> <laughs> you say like okay i'm gonna get you next time though yeah i might beat myself up over the specific move that i made and when you beat yourself choice. up like let's stay here like when you beat yourself up how does that sound i just think of if i hadn't done that it would have gone differently but then you don't have a second hit which is like i can i'm so stupid like Damn it. And like, I'll never I, I'll never be able to get that right. Yeah. No, I no. think back to that moment and I think in that moment I wish I had done something different. And then it stops there. Yeah. Okay, but so and that train of thought doesn't lead to um like a depressed state or a hopeless state or such an agitated state that you don't like being inside yourself. No, I think okay. if anything it leads to I if if I could have one thing, it would be a chance to <laughs> redo that. Yeah. Because okay. I know I would act differently. Last we spoke, you were not sure if you were going to get a chance to to walk in space. <laughs> and I remember you said something like, "It's this is a Super Bowl type of moment. Like This is something that you were really hopeful for. Not everyone gets a chance. And if it all kind of comes together in a way, you just might be tapped to be able to go. And it happened. It happened. Yep. I was really lucky. I got to do two spacewalks. Uh, they happened in short succession. We call them, we call it kind of like a spacewalk season or a spacewalk series where um, on board the space station, we get in the mode, we being both the crew and mission control, we get in the mode where most of what we're doing is preparing for and executing spacewalks. And so I got to do two, uh, installing uh, two ISS rollout solar arrays. These are big, big objects. Okay. Uh, they they roll out. Uh, I don't know the size that they roll off to roll out to offhand, but it's tens of feet, like really, really large object. In my hands, uh, the ISS rollout solar array before it rolls out is. Um, I mean, it's this box like this wide, this tall, and it's I like think five or feet, ten feet, five, long. three feet by, by ten. ten. Oh, so to it's twelve. It, Feet. Uh, it weighs 800 pounds. Like a big coffin? Yes, like a big coffin. That's a great, yeah, it's like a big coffin. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a funny analogy, but okay. Uh, it weighs 800 pounds. Yeah. Now, obviously, it's weightless up there, but okay. you feel the inertia of it. Anyway, I got to install two of those. It was amazing. When you got notification mm -hmm. that you were going to have the chance, do you remember that moment? It kind of played out. Over time, I knew that those two spacewalks were um, slated for the time frame of my mission. Uh, but it, there were also some changes with cargo vehicles where for a little while there was a chance that they might come out of my mission. Mm. And then, um, yeah, so it's, I, I kind of knew that if everything went to plan, they would be happening. And eventually I heard that I would be the one of the crew members doing those spacewalks i think so there's just there's always this element of yes but things could go wrong and you never know you, it might not actually play out to plan is there a uh, guiding philosophy that helps you um appreciate particular moments but not be overly you know um, banking or betting where you fall apart if it doesn't happen like do you have a model that you when you get some exciting information because you really wanted to go it was clear that you work from so that you can, um, you know, not get your hopes too high and also not be disappointed or what? I don't, I don't know. Is there a model that you work from there? I don't know if a specific model, but I do think that I naturally take that approach. I set expectations very low. You do. <laughs> uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And this helped me. The best example I have is actually the selection process back when I was, that's right. Uh, Trying to get you thought you had a zero 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 percent chance. Mm -hmm. I truly believed deep down inside that my chances of getting selected were zero, mm -hmm. and to become an astronaut. To become an astronaut. Yep. That was so liberating because it made the interview process. I I don't. I, why, would, why I wasn't it? faking it but, to myself. Yeah, but why? Why even if you think you have a zero percent chance, why waste the energy to apply? Right, because it was so fun. So this is the cool thing. I I went down to Houston. I spent a week meeting all these amazing people, going through all these tests seeing nasa uh it was really fun and i believed so strongly at my core that my chances of getting selected were zero that i remember telling myself 
that was so fun. In four years, when they have the next application, you're definitely applying. Mm. So you can do that interview process again because that was so fun. I, I'm having a hard time thinking I, about like the utility in this, <laughs> other than the self-esteem saving mechanism of, but it feels like if you thought I have zero chance of success later, the model usually is like, don't put in the effort now, mm. but you're saying, right, I'm actually living the the experience in and of itself mm -hmm. is the win. Yep. Yeah. And meeting all those people that I can't overstate enough. And this cool. is where it is mm -hmm. actually a little humbling to get selected. When you go down to interview, especially in the final round, the people I met down there uh, in the interview process, many of them did not get selected, were some of the most amazing people I've ever met. They all had incredible life stories. They all were just the best of the best in such unique ways, different ways really diverse set of backgrounds, amazing group of people, like the type of people you would want to be surrounded by. Right. So that interview week was yeah. just the most amazing life experience. And it made me want to do that again, meet people like that again. And it also made it really humbling to get selected because I that group for me was, it was indistinguishable looking out to say so-and-so is better than another person. That that type of judgment, I, I don't envy the selection board because I, I wasn't able to really discern those differences, Very and it cool. made me feel like, huh, I don't know how I got picked within this group. There's a refreshing aspect to that, which is like choose things that um, are are pointing towards places you'd like to go and do, and the experience in itself needs to also have the same value. Right. Like the interview process had high value. value. Yep. Yep. And it was in the right direction of things that you enjoyed. Yep. Okay. I totally respect and, and see myself in that type of thinking as well. Okay. So I said, I'm having a hard time with just one aspect. Like I, I, if I don't think I have any chance at, I don't know, um, hitting a home run in a ballpark, I, I'm probably not going to go to training on it, you know, but but if I really love training and what it feels like to hit a ball, then, okay, like, like that sounds fun to me. Yeah. I got it. And I mean, of course I knew my chances were not zero, but they felt vanishingly small to me. That was my experience. Was that the, Which is not deflating to you. It's just, it's okay. It was okay. I see. And I think, so you were asking, I forget the specific question, but you Spacewalk. were- Spacewalk? Well, and the- the details of um, when, whether the moment, I get my heart set on the, the model you use, the model when you get the for, information, right? And so I do. I do think it was very liberating for me also to not assume I was going to get selected because it meant that I assumed I was going to keep doing. At that time, I was a professor at MIT leading a research group, and I just assumed that was what I was going to keep working Which on. Which is a good path. It was a great path, mm. and I got a lot of value out of it. And I, I remained invested in that. Okay. And by not getting my expectations up. And if I hadn't gotten the job, it would have been fun. Maybe it's a bit of a crutch again, but I think similar with the spacewalk, I didn't want to get my hopes set on that because I knew there was a chance that I would not get to do one. And I wanted that to be okay. I feel that. I did not completely. want all of my ambition to be anchored to this thing that I didn't have control over whether I got to do. I love it. To drill a point home, let's go back to the 90s, or early 2000s when mail was a thing, snail mail. And um, I, I can imagine one scenario, like eagerly running out to your front door to, to the mailbox every day, like, okay, the letter from NASA is coming this week. Monday, you go out. Oh, it didn't come. Okay, okay. That's one way to go through it. Another way is like, it's coming this week. And if it lands on the kitchen table, it's going to be fun to open that. But whenever it happens, it happens. So one would be um, uh, like this, like eagerness to get the news. And the other one is like more casual, which I think is more aligned to your approach. So are you more aligned with that second one? Like when it lands on the kitchen table, I'm going to open it and that'll be fun. Or are you like privately, oh man, is it coming on Wednesday or is it, okay, it didn't come yet. Maybe it's going to, maybe it's going to be next week. I don't know. Like that anticipation. 
I think it is a completely natural human emotion to have anticipation for events mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Natural. Yeah. I certainly feel it. I yeah. don't know how I could not. Yeah. If I know that I'm going to get some news on a certain day, of course I feel anticipation. Mm -hmm. I wonder what the news is going to be. Mm -hmm. So that seems normal and natural, and I certainly experience that. I also think logically we can only control the events that we can control, and logically to me it's probably valuable to spend my time worrying about and working on things that I have control over. So any time and energy that I spend stressed out about this upcoming news that I have no control over at this point, to me is time wasted, even though it's natural to feel that. That's cool. So mm -hmm. I think I'm intentionally or subconsciously finding ways to push those feelings out mm -hmm. and spend less time stressing about things that I can't control. That's right and spend more time on other things. So I remember the day that I knew, the day that I got the call saying I had been selected, I knew we were gonna get phone calls that day, one way or another. We were gonna get a yes or a no. Right. And honestly, I just, I was so busy with my work. Mm. I just buried myself in work. And I remember having some, every, Every once in a while, some anticipation would creep in and I would kind of feel the heart rate increase and think, oh, I, I guess we're going to find out. But then I just was busy and I was so busy running my lab That's cool. that I didn't have time to worry about that. That is, the, that is the activation of your philosophy, which is, and you did something very clever. You said, don't focus on what you can't control. Worry about the things. No, work on the things I can control. <laughs> did you see that gymnastics you did? Just, I didn't even notice Yeah, that. which was really <laughs> cool. And then you just... You just did it again where you, you didn't use the word worry, but you're like, focus on those things. And so that type of investment in the task at hand has probably been something you've practiced for a long period of time. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's go back in. Um, this is a high pressured moment. Um, you're being suited up. Mm -hmm. What is that like for you in that moment when you know you're about to go outside? All the, all the attachments have been done, da, 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 da. Now you're going to step out into outer space. Yeah. So there's a, there's a bit of anticipation. It's actually pretty boring, the suit up, uh, many parts of it. There's a few key elements where we're all watching, kind of making sure it gets done right. Um, why wouldn't you? Uh, then there's other portions of time where you're just uh, spending time waiting for the nitrogen to get out of your blood. And so we do these, we, it's called in-suit light exercise, but we, uh, we do like really light leg kicks. We're just trying to get a little bit of motion, get the blood going. Um, and that's all we're doing. We're just sitting there. So there's a little bit of anticipation in that time. Mm -hmm. There's not much you can and what's do. What's that like for you? For me, uh, that was just, it's kind of like maybe being at the starting line of a race. That's the best analogy I have. Okay. So activation. Yeah. Yep. Knowing and that there's something coming that's going to be. So testing and yeah it's gonna, gonna challenge be exciting you and, and yeah. it's gonna you want to perform well you're gonna be in it soon but you're not in it yet so okay. it's just an anticipation of soon i'll be in it has anyone died on a spacewalk on a spacewalk ooh, that's good trivia not to my knowledge certainly on the u.s side no mm -hmm. um yeah not to yeah. my knowledge on a spacewalk it's um, a, it's a really remarkable i i would have guessed no because i i feel like we would have known about it like but you know right so it's a remarkable thought because it's the most dangerous hostile external conditions on the planet and no one's died it speaks to the readiness and preparation to the skill to the care to the attention to detail to the commitment to excellence it speaks to that um so what is the pressure then <laughs> that you're gonna you could be the first Oh, what's the pressure? What, 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 why, pressure, what, what anticipation the, are we feeling? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I do think that spacewalking is legitimately uh, dangerous. And uh, we have a huge amount of amazing preparation, a huge team making sure that we do it safely. So I don't want to, it's not that we're taking on a bunch of risk that we shouldn't be. That's right. But when, yeah. we, when we talk about, you know, we, we often talk about the dynamic phases of flight. And these are the places where maybe the risk is dialed up to, or the, at least the, the hazards at least are dialed up a little bit. And so 
Those are launch, re-entry, and we typically include spacewalking as as one of those times when there's just a lot of hazards. Okay. And we, you know, we lost the Challenger crew during launch. That's correct. We lost the Columbia crew during re-entry. Mm. I'm thankful that we haven't lost any crews during EVA. Nice. But dude. it is yeah. uh it is not mm. uh it is not nothing. Yeah. There are okay. hazards. Now, you asked what what's the sort of activation, what's um I'm not I have 100% trust in my equipment and my team and what we're doing. I'm not actively scared that I'm going to get hurt there going go. outside. Yeah. I fe- I didn't feel that at all actually. Okay. Um I knew logically that that there's risks, but I wasn't feeling scared about that. Okay. So for me, all of the anticipation, it's similar to a race. When you start a race, when you're going to compete, uh, it doesn't feel like I'm going to get hurt or injured, but it does feel, I do feel that anticipation. It's a, there's a readiness. I'm mm-hmm. ready to go perform. There you and go. so I just feel the, that anticipation of wanting to have a good performance that day. Very cool. Okay. Well, well said. All right. Um, pre- it, how do you think about pressure? Not the actual physical pressure, but how do you think about pressure, psychological pressure? I love it. <laughs> you do like it. Yeah. And what does pressure feel like to you? I've asked that question, a feeling question to you like 10 times, but what are the conditions that create pressure and what does pressure feel like? Two-part question. Maybe it's back to what we talked about earlier, anticipation. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel it so much less when I'm performing the actual task. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a good performer's response. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but the, so what sets the conditions? Something important is about to happen. Something scary is about to happen. Da, da, da. So there's some sort of framing that something is, is about to happen. And oftentimes the way I think about the way I feel pressure is it's, I have to think or do something faster than I think I'm capable of. So that's for me what pressure feels like. There's a boxing in and there's a tightening up. And it's because I've overestimated the challenge and underestimated my skills, or mm. if I've accurately estimated the challenge and accurately estimated my skills that I'm not sure. So there's a pressure there. And the secondary pressure is like um, the pressure of managing my sense of self and my identity, which is if I blow it, how will I be perceived? I think I've done a really good job in my life of mitigating that to something that is marginal not that important but that calculus between what is the external challenge and what is my internal skill set is a is is a dynamic flux and i always want it to be in that challenge zone at, as opposed to that threat zone which is like uh oh <laughs> you know like i don't know i i don't have these tools i can't do what i can't do a spacewalk so that would be like this radical threat zone maybe m- maybe if there's extraordinary set of circumstances and they're like you're the only one that's going to fit in this fucking suit then I go, okay, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust the equipment. I'm going to have to trust myself to navigate a challenge in an environment I haven't been. And I would look and defer, like, you got to tell me what to do and how to, how to mm-hmm. like, navigate this. And I'm going to trust you in that. that. Maybe we get that done. So my point is really about the calculus. So what are the conditions that create that calculus for you that it's off? Mm. Where the challenge is perceived higher than the skill? And part two, what does it feel like? when you're in a moment of pressure? Maybe I can answer it by flipping it a bit. Yeah, cool. uh, To when it's on. So I think for the, to continue the spacewalking example, um, I felt so prepared and that gave me confidence. Mm -hmm. So the training for EVA, uh, we do it in something called the neutral buoyancy lab. It's this pool down in Houston. Um, I spent a bunch of time underwater in the suit, getting used to it, practicing spacewalking. And that training was so important and valuable. There's lots of training that we do. You know, if we started trying to eliminate training and say, yeah, you can fly to, you can probably fly to space and do this experiment, even though you've never seen that hardware, follow the procedure, you'll figure, you'll figure it, it out. out. You'll mm-hmm. figure it out. We said that jinx. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> You know, can you, so there's, there's maybe some things you could start, okay, maybe we could get away. It'd be nice to have this training, but maybe we could get away without that training and without that training. That the last thing on that list, the very last one, um, maybe aside from like emergency procedures, uh, would be 
neutral buoyancy lab, training in the suit, getting used to spacewalking. When people show up at, as astronaut candidates, nobody's been in a spacewalk be, or in a space suit before. Correct. Nobody has that life experience. Correct. It's weird. If you were to list three to five psychological skills that are important for people to operate in high pressured environments like you were in, or consequential environments, or however you describe working in the in the space station. What would those, what would you point to? And the part two of that question is, did you do specific training on those psychological skills? Hmm. Psychological skills that allow a person to, to be successful in a high pressure environment. Uh, would you call this a high pressure first, environment? Well, it's that's such an interesting question because, yeah. I mean, you have to realize, as you know, my mission was six months. Yeah, that's why Six I even, I, that's why I asked the question. Like, so how do you describe the environment? There are phases. Uh, the best analogy we have is aviation. Okay. And I, I think there's a, people quip in aviation about like, it's, it's mostly sheer boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. Um, and nothing on my mission was sheer terror. That would be an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. uh, we had failures. We had things that didn't go right. Um, we had challenges to overcome. I think... Um, it's six months. So, and you know, a lot of stuff feels mundane. You sleep. I mean, I spent eight hours every night asleep. Mm -hmm. So I think it's maybe easy to think you're in space. Wow. It must be just the most high paced, frantic, just yeah, kind of high pressure right. situation at all it's times. No, you're like asleep for a lot of it. Yeah. Right. Um, Stand, <laughs> vertical. Yeah. <laughs> Vertically. <laughs> but, but you're also needing to be ready for when things do go wrong and you really feel up there the 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 consequence so is it a consequential environment it's a consequential environment when go. things go mm -hmm. wrong they can start going wrong quickly like chris hatfield are you familiar with yeah. he had soap in his he talked about it on our on the on an earlier episode that he had it, soap on the inner lining of his visor oh it's the probably the anti-fog yeah yeah and the, so yeah. he went um Okay. Yeah. So it was some eye irritation. Yeah. Yeah. And he couldn't see. And so they had to, he was awesome about how he talked about working the problem. Yep. Right. You, you don't freak out. You just work the problem. Does that makes sense too. Oh, absolutely. Is that, that a, um, so much sense. Is that a NASA phrase or is that something that like, um, that's part of training or is that something that he uniquely coined or not coined, but like understood? I think that's just a standard operational environment work, you stuff. work the problem yeah you work the problem yeah it's really cool um yeah i think our um our mission control team is really really good about this our mission you know you were talking earlier about that feeling of i don't know i, I screwed up or something went wrong something didn't go the way i want it to yeah we're not in the place we wanted to be right 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 and maybe how it's easy you could spend time worrying about that this is something that flight controllers in mission control get trained on and do sims on which is if something has gone not correctly, your job in that moment is not to apologize or spend time worrying about what could have been different. Your job in that moment is to deal with what you have now and work the problem and, you know, fess up, say where we're at and figure out a solution. So provide and they information work on, and ask questions and look for solutions. Perfect. Is that it? They, that's uh, how you work a problem for, co for communication and mission control. The, uh, the framework that's taught to mission con controllers is failure impact workaround. And that's actually, that's not how you're supposed to address the problem. That's how you're supposed to communicate. Say but if again. you want a failure impact workaround. So I've had a failure in the system. The impact to the team is the following. And my workaround is that I propose we, you know, start this contingency procedure. Interesting that it's not solution. Workaround is a just a different. It, it's a little bit more colloquial. It's a little bit more casual, but it's obviously not a casual experience. Yeah, and in and that environment, you know, that's what we call real time ops. So that's dealing with the problem right now for the next few minutes or hours. So, and I don't know if this is relevant, but when I think of solution, I think maybe a little bit longer term. You know, how are we actually going to solve this? So but work around this a little bit more, like a patch. This like is we're going to work around yeah. this problem. We're going to figure out how to keep our crew and vehicle safe right now. And then we'll figure out the solution 
That, yeah, that's yeah. a really nice distinguishing feature. Okay. What, what do you know now that you didn't know before? I think it's easy to think that maybe there will be some epiphany or something that occurs in this amazing, unique life experience. I'll just, right off the bat, I have no epiphanies to share. Um, <laughs> I had an amazing experience. I learned a lot. I grew a great deal as a human. I, uh, it was life-changing for me. It's hard for me to articulate succinctly how. Uh, it's, that was six months of my life, of me growing and experiencing failures and experiencing uh, successes and spending time with my amazing team. Um, so think of anything that's kind of life-changing that plays out over a long period. It's kind of like that. I, I don't have <sighs> lightning bolt moments really. And I don't recognize them at the moment until I think I look back like, I don't know, a couple of years from it or 10 years or whatever. And I go, Oh, that moment somehow it registered. Yeah. And then it's like that, when I piece it together, I think that that was a really important thing that led me down this path or to pursue that or think about things yeah. this way. So maybe there's a little bit more time. I think one aspect that I spent some time reflecting on was actually making mistakes. And um, I guess to get it you know, right off the bat, everybody that goes to the space station for six months makes mistakes. I mean, have you made any mistakes in the last six months? No. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, right. So, yeah. I mean, in this conversation, these, these can, no. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. So, you know, it's uh, it's really attractive to think maybe you're going to go up there and like follow every procedure perfectly and do really well, and uh, there will be no mistakes. But that's like not possible. Period. So, uh, but the good news is I didn't make any really big mistakes. I made some maybe like medium mistakes that I beat myself up over, but in the grand scheme of things, none of them were a big deal. And so I think what I reflected on was just like my process of handling when I make a mistake. Um, or, and what I mean by mistake, mistake is almost too strong a word. I really mean like when I do something and then I think back and think, I could have done that better or I could have, I wish I had done it this other way or that wasn't, it's just not sitting with me right the way I handled that situation. I, I kind of wish I had handled it a little bit differently. That's an uncomfortable feeling for me, but I reflected a lot. You know, that happened a lot. Um, you're, we're, we have hundreds of people watching us when we're on the ISS. There's video cameras all over the place. You're constantly, you know, we have, a, and that's a very positive thing. We have a huge team supporting us, but we're also kind of under, you, it could feel like a bit of scrutiny. And I just got so used to that environment and being comfortable with, oh, okay, I didn't do that perfectly. That's okay. I'll just tell the team and we'll move on. And I guess kind of flipping how I think about things a little thinking about things a little bit less in the past and thinking more in the future. And so every time a little experience like that occurred for me where I thought I could have done that better or I wish I had done that differently, by the end of the mission, I was like instantly thinking, I'm so happy that I get to do that again tomorrow because I'm going to do it better. I spent no time worrying about how I did it today. I was just like, oh, it's it's awesome that I that I get to like try again today. I love this insight. So let's say a mistake happens. You can perseverate on, on what happened and be critical and catch yourself and have a little bit of um, uh, hesitation for making the same mistake based on the way that you speak to yourself about it. That, that makes sense to a lot of people, I think, right? Or you can frame it, got it, what I need to learn. So there's a, tactic, uh, a tactical nature to the mistake that took place for a learning environment. And it's been more time forward facing and you even using your imagination to imagine when I'm in this conversation tomorrow, I want to make sure that I make eye contact. Okay. Or when I'm holding this tool and doing this, da 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 da, that I'm actually not going to strip the bolt again. I'm actually going to be thoughtful about how, right? So it requires a reflective nature to think about the learning that needs to happen, but then quickly get forward leaning. Yeah. 
right? Like yep. that's a really cool way to go through life. And if we're not careful, we spend so much time on the on the history of the event and then the critical nature of it that we spend very little time planning and using our beautiful imagination for, you know, setting a scene that we'd like to, how we'd like to do it in the future. I love it. Yeah. That's spot on. That's great, dude. And when it's subtle, you know, oh, I didn't realize that this, um, I didn't realize some subtlety of like how this procedure is written or how these parts are marked or whatever it is. But I didn't realize this subtlety. I, do, I didn't know that. It was tricky. Um, my framing was like, oh, now I've got, but now I've got that knowledge. I, I screwed up. I made, I made something, I, a m mistake. Again, I think that might be too strong a word, uh, but I, I, I didn't get it quite right in the way I wanted to last time. But kind of flipping that to next time I see this, I'm going to crush it. <laughs> Because I had that experience. I love like, that phrase. <laughs> that, that's my vibe too. Like, and I hope what I hope that when people are listening, that they're like, "Oh, I get it." Like, there's a phrase that somebody taught me, which is like, "No, no, no. We always make the things better. We make everything better." That idea is so powerful for me. It gives me such. You use the word liberation. So much space, so that when something happens, we're going to use that too. When it doesn't go according to plan or I make a mistake or something like I'm going to catalog, I'm going to learn. And I'm, of course, that's how I lean in life. We're going to make it better. You know? So it, I, I love that framing as just a way to go through experience. It frees me up to be in this moment because I don't, I'm going to make mistakes. And by the way, athletes who are paying attention, like every game you make mistakes. Absolutely. Um, uh, humans that are listening <laughs> every day, you're making mistakes, you know? And, uh, the Dr. Woody Hol Holberg, sa Holberg says that he has made mistakes on the ISS. Like, absolutely. Let's free ourselves up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, Woody. So there's we're we're talking about the way that we're speaking to ourselves, like our feedback loop within ourselves relative to our experience. Mistake, something goes well. There's a feedback loop that's taking place all the time, by the way. And then in high performing organizations, there's feedback loops between people as well. So a high-performing organization tends to have high-performing feedback loops. And those feedback loops, in my mind, have some criteria or some characteristics that tend to show up. And I'd love to hear your take. I don't know how much you've thought about it or trained for high-performance feedback loops. But when I just say that phrase and you think of an experience at ISS and your teammates, whether they're on the ground um, in Houston and other places or teammates that are in the ISS with you. How does high performing feedback take place? Yeah. Um, I saw that in many different contexts. Uh, we have, I think a great culture of debriefing. So everyone I worked with in the context of human space flight, whether it's the crew on board or teams in mission control or engineering teams that want to make their hardware better. I think I've always seen a culture of debriefing. Let's, let's, write down some feedback and let's use it to make ourselves better in the future. That's across the board. Um, Pause. When something happens, there's a little activity, whether it's a conversation, a meeting, a, an activity that takes place. How does the debrief, is there a process for debrief that you have found to be useful or NASA has informed? Yeah. So um, I saw this in several different like contexts and modalities. So within the crew, that's one place we can start. Um, we just had kind of a, maybe every week or two, usually on Friday, we would come together. I would call out Frank Rubio was my, we call it the USOS lead, but it's, uh, on our side of the station. It's kind of the, our leader, um, for our, our crew. And he, he did such a good job with this. It was fairly informal. Actually, we just circled up and we basically said, uh, we literally said, does anyone have anything? And that was kind of the. That just means like bring up whatever you want. It could be little interpersonal things. It could be little things about how we're interacting with the ground, just within the crew. You know, what does what do people see about how we could be better? And it could be really small stuff. Uh, and by doing this fairly often, um, we just kind of bring it up and handle it. How it could long be really, is this? This session? could be really. I'll give you a concrete example. Like yeah. we have water bags. 
So um, it's a bag of water and you almost always have one with you because you just need to be drinking as you're going about your day. You're moving through the space station and it's like Velcroed to your leg, your bag of water uh, or, a, or a drink. It might be a coffee. It's got Velcro on it so you can put it wherever you want. Um, and a lot of times you'll be working and you'll stick the water bag next to your work site. Um, well, it's really easy, particularly when you first get on board, to accidentally leave those all over the place. It's like leaving an empty coffee cup sitting on a table. Mm-hmm. Happens all the time. Kind of makes a mess. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's an example where, you know, that was I, – I know – a couple people brought that up a couple times like hey i'm noticing that we're leaving these out dr more Holborn, often. please put your water away. <laughs> yeah <laughs> not even an individual yeah just it's, it's, in general i'm noticing we're doing that let's be conscientious let's just try to remember mm-hmm. like if you notice your drink out like let's grab it um so that's an example super minor doesn't really in the grand scheme of things matter at all but is also one of those things where you wouldn't want to get to a point where it's like, Mike's always leaving his water around. What a jerk. And now we're starting to have a team dynamic that's not great. Well, so let's say, does anyone have anything? And you say, you know, it's a general. I think it'd be great. Like, let's be conscientious about uh, our water bottles, to your point. And then I register it and I go, yeah, oh, yeah, I think that might be me. Okay, I'm going to be better. And then uh, next Friday comes around. Anyone have anything? Hey, uh, you know, like water bottles or, or water bags are still kind of late. And I haven't, I've done, a, I've done a bad job. Mm-hmm. Okay. I have not taken action properly and my stuff is everywhere. I'm a mess. How would you recommend, or how did you guys address the Gervais that's a slob? Like that's happening now. It's becoming, we're not at the team dynamic thing that's problematic, but you're a little frustrated because action hasn't taken place. Sure. Yeah. I think I feel really lucky. First of all, our crew was amazing. Everybody got along really well, which I just feel very fortunate for. We had a great group and we kind of meshed well together. And I think all of us, just personality wise, were pretty direct communicators and had maybe somewhat thick ish skin. Um, and what I mean by that is in that situation, we would just say it, you know, we would just address it like, hey, I, I don't know, and, and take ownership for it, you know, if you realize we're talking about you. Yeah, and, and laugh about it a little maybe. Yeah. But but then, you know, if if it gets to that point, you just say, oh, yep, that's me. Okay, I, I really do need to get this better. Okay. Um, and it just doesn't become a thing. It's just address it. And how do you set um, the conditions ahead of time for that feedback to be uh, received well when I, it's direct? I think that's a cultural thing mm-hmm. where we just have to be intentional. We have to say, we are going to debrief. We are going to have these, you know, we're living together for months uh, without some intentionality around debriefing and communicating and dealing with little tensions when they come up or whatever they are. Um, Without that, things aren't going to go well. So we are going to do that and make it go well. Do you you think this is a good strategy for date night? No, I'm I'm being serious. (laughs) Like when I like go out date night with my wife uh, once or twice a week now, it's really cool. so is it, do you, would you, I'm not asking, I am now asking relationship advice. I'm probably you. not the right one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but like, like, what was the, what was the question? Does anyone have anything going on? I can yeah, imagine I, me I, saying to my, my wife, like, I, okay, what do we got going on? Another like, cool structure on? is uh, one up, one down. Yeah. That's a military. But yeah. What's your, uh, to give me one up and one down. What's a good thing and what's a bad thing? Yep. Boom. So what we use at Finding Mastery yeah. that I've learned from special ops is it's two things. What went well? What do you want to work on? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a framing that we like. And then we're trying to get as applied in nature as we can. Yeah. So that we can be, they can be actionable. Sometimes they're insights, you know, and sometimes it's reinforcing. But so, so the question that you guys used often was, strike that, the question that your team used often was, what what do we have going on? Does anyone have something going on? Does anyone have something? And we would, and you try to, if nobody does, that's not good. Because there's kind of this natural, it's a debrief or it's a, it's a chance to sync up as a team. And if, if you meet and say, does anyone have anything and nobody has anything and you leave, that's not a good debrief. Copy. So uh, one thing I think you can do to be a good teammate is to say something, anything. Just get the conversation going. That's cool. And then it's, it's amazing the little things that will come up when 
I mean, I personally experienced many times showing up to these quick team. These are five or 10 minute quick hot wash, uh, showing up to them and thinking, I don't know. I don't have anything for tonight. I don't know. Everything's going well. I don't have anything. And then we start talking a little and everybody's got something to this to is mention. how this is how like <laughs> therapy in my like when i'm in on the i'm in the client seat that's how it works all the time i'm driving into therapy and with my wife or, or with, by myself and i'm like and I, i'm pretty good like I, yeah and all of a sudden like a good. question like anything going on what do you want to talk about today i don't know and then like another question will like um how was that conversation you had with such and such that you wanted to have Oh God! Thank God you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, right, totally. that is so good. So totally. just creating the conditions and, and it has. yes, right, like holding that space. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then so that was the more intimate. Yep. You know, and would you say that that's more of a hot wash, like the framing that I was talking about? That's yeah, like and that's. I mean, we know each other really well, so yeah. that's really. Um, you know, we've been experiencing all the things up there. That's just a chance to verbalize things if you've been thinking things um, before. Yeah, just a chance would to any, share with, with the team what's going on. Would anyone um, bring up something more intimate, like I'm struggling with my relationships? Yeah, you know, sure. like like it, this is not just tactics of like water bags. Sure. Hey guys, I am I'm having a kind of rough week, yeah. so if you'll just watch me, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe uh, give me a hand once in a while, that'd be great. You know, some other things that I, you know, as somebody who likes to. Do a good job. Be self-sufficient. Um, like I've got it. You know, a, a couple other little subtleties that I feel like I've learned uh, partially before the mission and also during the mission. You know, asking for help. I don't like asking for help, mm. but we had a culture that, uh, or we just had a, a kind of agreement on board as a crew that if somebody's day is running long, we all help them out. Try to. We all, we're not all done till like everybody's done with their tasks for the day. Sometimes you run long. It's not because you're slow or bad at what you're doing. It's just, you got a, some activity that was not planned well or whatever it is. So my, here's my point. Um, the hardest thing to do is, and the best thing you can do for your team is actually to ask for help because they all want to help and I they don't want to get turned away. Uh -huh. you're, you're actually kind of being a jerk if you say, Hey, I got it. I'm good no problem. And then you sit there working while everybody else wants to eat dinner and they have to watch you work. So you do have to think about how to ask for help to delegate to sure. creatively. So sometimes it takes longer to explain something to do it. I, I hear that often amongst our team. Like it's just easier if I do it. And so, sure. yeah. But some of this, I mean, we could all do this. It's not, it's not a hard task. It's just taking a while. Yeah. And it feel you feel that natural emotion of I got it, I got it, no problem, don't worry, mm -hmm. guys, I got it, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But the best thing to do there is to say it would be awesome if you guys would go like stow that item for me. That cool. would be a big help. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but just can somebody go clean up my water bags? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great example. I don't want to let this slip, but you you said like I have a reluctance to ask for help. What, what is that? I think that's just, I, I do think I have sort of a self-sufficiency as a core value. I've always had that. I've always felt like I can do it. I'll figure it out. I've got it. So yeah, just self-sufficiency as a core value. And, and so, so that bonds up against it when somebody says, can I help you? Yeah. Or when you would like help, it pushes up against, I can, I, I ought to be. Or I am self-reliant. Yes. Yeah. Both to both of those yep. statements. Yeah. Yeah. And then how do you how do you work through that that core value and the actual um, need in a particular moment to to re relieve yourself from the self-reliance and ask for or include people in what you're doing? I think we uh, and this was where I kind of grew on this a bit on board. You know, we talked about this in some of the debriefs very concretely about you it's like no not about me just self-reliance no I, and i don't we no i couldn't it's not that anybody up there like needed more help than anybody else it's not that like that at all we literally talked about hey if somebody is running long at the end of the day um it we talked about this uh 
it feels like you want to say, guys, I got it. But it's actually the most helpful thing to the team if you give everybody a way to, to contribute. Because as a team, we all just feel it's like you go to a dinner party and one person gets up and starts watching the dishes and everybody watches, wa watches them watch the dishes. It's kind of uncomfortable. There's one person doing work and everybody else is sitting around. Nobody likes that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's actually helpful if people can have tasks to mm -hmm. pitch in. There's a little Not bit of planning in that too. A little bit of planning in that. Yeah. yeah. And some thoughtfulness just, about the other person's yeah. experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool, yeah. So, really and cool. it's not that I mean, anybody can do the dishes. It's not hard. And it's not that you need the help, but it's just the overall group experience of at the end of the day, how can this be just best and smooth, the smoothest for the team? Will you do a debrief, a hot wash with me and, and the team after this about this experience? Would you be open to that? Sure. Cameras come off and yeah. we'll actually do it. I'd yeah. love it. Uh, that'd be fun. Yeah. Okay. And then we also, you know, your question. So we covered... Uh, within the crew. We also have intentional debriefs uh, with the NASA teams for kind of the, the big deal dynamic events. So for EVA, for robotic ops, like when we capture a, a visiting vehicle with the robotic arm, for launch and docking, when we did our port relocation, so we actually undocked and flew around to a different port. Um, for all of these events, we have a scheduled time to it's like an hour with the teams on the ground. They may have some specific questions, uh, technical issues they were working. They want to get our the crew's input on them. And it's also just a chance to talk about, hey, how did it go, you know, while it's still fresh in our mind. And then finally. And what is the duration of time between the event and the debrief? Day or two. That's actually seems sloppy. Like, like I know that you it was reflective day or two. Like I what I found for high performance feedback is that. Um, after the 48, after the 24 hour glow, I said 48, after the 24 hour glow, this is, it's a radical drop off mm. on accuracy yeah. of the, so, so sometimes it's 24, sometimes it's 48. Well, um, yeah, that sounds about right. I will mm. also say like for my EV, for my spacewalk, I remember getting on the, getting on a private loop with our flight director the night at like right after that's I got right. out of the suit yeah. for a very quick, there that's were a couple a, of like that's hot That's a real topics. hot wash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, they were thinking about a couple little things and we did it right away. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was like, okay, we'll cover the rest of everything in uh, the scheduled debrief in a couple of days. That's it, there you go. Um, yeah, so accuracy um, is really important during feedback and then timeliness of it. Yeah. And so, right, and so there's an accuracy piece, there's a kindness piece, which we didn't talk about, um, but when you're a jerk in feedback, it's <laughs> it's problematic, you know. So accuracy, kindness, and timeliness, yeah, uh, are the three variables that I think go into high performance feedback. But the timeliness is another good one. We we have a formal debrief process right after we land, and so I actually spent literally weeks after I landed, the first few weeks after I was back on Earth, a major portion of that was technical debriefs with various technical groups that support space station ops. Um, I literally spent hours and hours in debriefs, um, which is really valuable. These uh, groups had really detailed questions, things they're working on, considerations that they're weighing different factors, and they want our input, having just been aboard the space station. Yeah. Um, so it's a valuable process. Uh, and actually, NASA right now is working on getting some elements of that pulled earlier to do it real time on board. Yeah, there you go. Crew time is really valuable, so it's really hard to weigh against you know time spent operating experiments or working on things on board versus time spent debriefing. But I think there's an acknowledgement of what you're pointing out that more timeliness is important, and the earlier we can do it, the more accurate we'll be, and the more yeah. valuable to be. There you go. Yeah, very cool. Can you paint the picture for what life was like? And on the ISS, the International Space Station. And maybe just start with the, the moment that you entered the ISS. That's a, so at that moment, I had spent about 24 hours in space. So we launch and then um, we spent 
about a day phasing up to align our orbit exactly with the the space station and dock. And um, well, actually, let me back it up. Orbital insertion. I, I just remember these distinct moments. So right after orbital insertion, you're weightless all of a sudden. Okay. And I... Sultan on our crew was the first to get up. He has to plug in the cabin mic and do a comm check. And so he did that. And I remember him saying, guys, I'm floating. This is amazing. It's just that moment of sheer That's kind cool. of yeah. life experience. Yeah, this is wild. Um, and a few minutes later, I got up out of my seat and floated over to the window and look, look outside and you see the curvature of Earth. Mm. I mean, in your face, just that's Earth. Boom, right there. Um, and then I had actually Bob Hines, uh, pilot for SpaceX crew four, who flew a little bit before me had, had kind of given me a heads up to look for this. So I, I went to the window and I looked down at earth and you're going five miles a second. So earth is sliding by under you. You are, you're going so fast and earth is just moving by. And right out the window, right below us is our second stage of our Falcon nine rocket flying in perfect formation with us. Oh, so we cool. had just separated yeah. from this oh, thing. Cool. It's yeah. a second stage of a rocket. Yeah. It's way bigger than the spacecraft I'm in. Yeah. And it's down there. It's going the same speed as us. And we're over top of it. And we're just flying in formation over Earth. Oh, and cool. that was really cool to yeah. see. Um, we spend 24 hours trying to kind of get used to um, what it's like to be floating, what it's like to handle food. We eat. We go to the bathroom on the on the Dragon spacecraft, but we're in pretty tight quarters, four people in a small little capsule. And then I remember seeing the International Space Station on our thermal camera. Now we had done this in training many times, but there's something about flying in for docking and seeing the thermal camera view of the International Space Station. It's this place that we've been training for for years. I know every module. I know where everything is. I know how the place is laid out. I know so much about this thing, but it's still, for me, always been off in space, like inaccessible. It's just this idea, but it's not a physical thing. Uh, it's an idea. And I just remember that moment of seeing it on our thermal camera and like we are arriving at the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. It was that sent chills down my spine. Um, we docked and then coming in, it's actually an interesting experience coming into the space station because the volume opens up so much. You've been in this small volume on Dragon and suddenly the spaces are just so much bigger. And we actually docked to the node to Zenith docking port. And so that means we are our spacecraft is upside down. <laughs> We're on the top of the space station. So as you pull yourself, we basically uh, pull ourselves up through the ceiling of our spacecraft and you go through a little tube called the IDA, the International Docking Adapter, kind of going through like a little tunnel and you're floating through it and then you pop out into the space station. But you're, and again, we went up through the ceiling of our spacecraft and then you pop out and you're coming down into the ceiling of the space station. Oh, it's quite geez. disorienting. <laughs> it sounds so, like it. Yeah. 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 Um, what does your so brain do in, in that? It, it sets up a local reference frame. Okay. So it's so, like real time right away. It adjusts. I was, it was fascinating. It's seconds. That you are familiar with what vertical, even though you're upside down. Yeah. Is. So I guess I should say the way the space station is laid out, we have, it tends to fly in a particular orientation. So there's one side of the space station that's almost always facing earth. And we call that deck. And then overhead is opposite that. And we have a port and a starboard. And so there is this reference frame of the space station. There is up and down in that sense. But your brain, if you crawl off into a tunnel or something, you have no idea which way is up or down. All you have is local. Mm. Um, and mm. your brain makes that switch in a matter of seconds. So a good example is our treadmill. Our treadmill is mounted on the wall. It's like on the wall. The track okay. is yeah. running on the wall. Yeah. The front of the treadmill, where the buttons are that you program things in, would be at the bottom on the floor. 
So you run on the wall, <laughs> facing the Head, floor. Yeah, running to headed the floor. straight to the floor. And I mean, you can be on, you can be watching somebody doing that, and you say, "That's kind of funny." You're running on the wall. Yeah, I'm watching right. you run on the wall. Yeah. When you're doing it, it feels like you're on a treadmill. You you don't your brain just says, "Yep, down is my feet, up is my head." Local reference frame. So when you come Always. through that, the IDEA? IDEA, yeah. IDEA, when you come yeah. through the IDEA and you, you're you now in this larger space, your brain is referencing quickly what's up, what's down, what, whatever. On that first day, I had a moment of confusion where I was like, I don't know which way is up. And, uh, but you quickly get it. And, um, and then I just remember seeing, in those very first moments, I just remember seeing people floating and you know, just that in these big volumes and it feels it's your brain just, it, it's just something you could stare at for a while. Like, huh, that's a, that's a person floating through that <laughs> room. And huh. then what is the day in the and, life like? So day in the life, it's busy up there and we're working on lots of different things. Every day is different. We have a timeline that's planned by the ground and it's in sometimes in as small as five minute chunks, the activities we're working on. Um, big picture, we are there to do scientific research. So that's the purpose of the space station is doing all these science experiments. So we spend a fair amount of our time, hands in a glove box, working on science mm -hmm. um, or whatever whatever it is. That's That's maybe one chunk. Second chunk would be maintaining the space station, keeping that beautiful orbiting outpost flying. So this is routine maintenance, like scheduled stuff. When things break unexpectedly, fixing it, um, bulbs, monitoring our systems, bolts, cleaning. Yep, changing out tanks. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. all I worked on our toilet a bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we fixed the treadmill. We had to work on our CO2 scrubbing system. Mm -hmm. There was a hatch that was stuck uh, and we had to figure out how to unstick the- Does, like, the, does the toilet smell? Um, it smells a little bit. It's not bad. It's not, like, um, you know, when you go in an RV, sometimes the shower toilet kind of has that- Yeah. It's not like that. I'm sure we build up a little bit of a um, like- pungent appreciation we we build okay. up a resistance to yeah right to, we get used to the smell yeah, okay. but um the toilet itself is not particularly bad the waste when where we store it if you go back into the location where we actually store some of the solid waste um and like the actual bag and you suck your nose up close to that it smells real bad yeah right but as long as you're pretty far away from it it's fine yeah okay um, so yeah, sorry. And then, so big, we have science, we have maintaining the space station that includes things like the spacewalks where we're doing upgrades and all the activities to prep for that, maintaining the suits. Um, and then finally taking care of ourselves. So eating and work, sleeping and working out. We are, we exercise like two hours a day. When we spoke, when you were up there, you were like, Chat. You are fit. You're like, I'm ready. Yeah, like, yeah, that is awesome. It's an yeah. hour of cardio and an hour of resistance exercise and every single day. I actually got a- Two um, hours. Two hours. Two cardio hours and strength. Yeah. yeah. And is that to maintain basic health or is that to be fit for optimal thinking, optimal movement? That's to maintain uh, muscle mass and bone density yeah. primarily for okay. our return. Okay. Uh, you are profoundly unloaded. Your whole skeletal structure has no force on it. Yeah the whole day, mm -hmm. except when you're doing exercise. Because you're, you're literally you're tethered floating. down. You're just floating. But no, when there. you're exercising. Oh, when we're exercising. So there was, yeah, the, um, mm -hmm. for the for the bike, you're clipped in and just biking. For the treadmill, we wear a harness. It's like a backpack. Right. Um, and we bungee ourselves to the treadmill with a fair amount of force. And then the resistance exercise, it's like a, um, it's this configurable machine that uses vacuum cylinders and we can do the, all the big lifts, squats, deadlifts, bench press, rows. Um, notably it doesn't do pull-ups. So I came back pretty darn weak on pull-ups. I could do like half what I was able to do before launch, mm -hmm. but I came back stronger on bench than when I launched. Mm -hmm. So it really shows you, mm -hmm. um, like you actually gained, I gained in, where you worked, Yep, which is really yeah. important for the whole tendon, bone, muscular, skeletal system yeah cardiovascular how'd yep. you come back 
I, I think about the same. About the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I know really early. We do a VO2 max. We we actually do VO2 max before flight. We do Aren't a couple of them on board. They're terrible. <laughs> yeah. I hate them. <laughs> they hurt. For folks that don't know, like you, you're masked up and yep. you've just basically got to run to the until you can't anymore. And we actually do it on the bike. Oh. And it's yeah. on, it's, uh, yeah. it's 25 watt increments. So you just, I think we start at like 150. And then every minute it's another 25 watts. Yeah. And you just keep pedaling till you. Until your brain, or I'm sorry, your mind or your body say, I'm done. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so my VO2 max was, was dramatically lowered in the like week or so after I got back. And, but I think it dramatically lowered on the order of 20%, um, 20 to 25. And then, um, but then you build it back. Mm -hmm. Um, so by a two months post or post landing, I was must have felt really normal. tired. Yeah. Right? Cause you have, all, yeah, it's really physical. You have all these fluid shifts going on. Um, gives you a sense of what it might feel like to be in a poorly run oxygenated system, right? Like you're, you're struggling to oxygenate your body yeah. when you came back. Right? Yeah. I was yeah. just tired a lot. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then the other moment I realize I remember is going to the because you were asking about that experience of being up there, mm. the, and um, I remember it was actually maybe a, a week or two after I had arrived, and I was starting to get used to things. I had been over to the cupola many times at that point. The cupola is this amazing panoramic module where we have windows looking down at Earth, and you just have this amazing picturesque view. I should say we're actually pretty close to Earth, so we're at two hundred and. 40, 250 miles above Earth. Mm -hmm. Earth's diameter is about 8,000 miles. So if Earth is 8,000 miles around, we are like less than a few percent of Earth's diameter away from Earth. Mm -hmm. We're really close. That's right. You can see Earth's curvature out there, but you can't see all of Earth. You're too close to see all of Earth. It's this giant blue marble right in your face. However, and you see, you see, uh, let's say India, how many times in 24 hours? So 16 orbits every 24 hours. So you see India, or, if you happen to pass through India. About twice a day. Or maybe. Africa is probably easier because it's so big. You'll do several passes over Africa yeah, yeah. in the day and then several passes over Africa at, at night. Yeah. How, um, how much bigger is like really Africa versus like all the other continents relative to the other? Can you tell from there? Uh, you can, I see it on paper. You actually get really used to what the different continents look like, which is really interesting. You yeah. can, you can not always, but most of the time, if you go up, up to the window after you've been up there for a few months, you can, you know where you are. And uh, so it, can you see the entirety of the U S nope, no. So you see, um, you'll, you'll see like Los Angeles, you'll see LA and, and then you'll literally like a minute later, you'll be flying over Vegas. And then like a couple minutes later, you'll be flying over Chicago. And then not long after that, you're over Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. So that's a typical pass. And so, yeah, several minutes to pass over the U.S. Mm -hmm. But so. Uh, Did you ever do tip to tail Africa? Um, yeah, we, I mean, we lots tip of. Tip to tail. Yeah. So then what, how long does it take if the U.S. I was a couple would, of minutes? I would be, it's, yeah, similar. I'm enamored by the size of it. Like, it, it yeah, know, yeah, it's, it's big. Yeah. The moment I realize, or the moment I just distinctly remember it's funny how you have these little distinct memories i remember being floating up to the cupola and in there there's there's fans all over the space station there's fans running um there's just always this kind of background like fans hmm. whirring just a little low background fan noise hmm. and i remember coming into the cupola and just spending like a, a short moment there and you hear this fan noise like, and that's it. That's the only noise you hear. And you're looking down as you fly five miles per second across the surface of the earth. So it was so profoundly quiet. Mm -hmm. You're in this machine mm -hmm. <laughs> that is going so fast, mm -hmm. absurdly fast. It's like just if it were an airplane, I mean, it be all the engines running to go that speed, you know, just obs it's, well, it's 17,500 miles an hour. It's faster than any airplane flies, right? By a lot. And yet it was pure peace and quiet, just a little fan running in the background. And I remember just thinking to myself, like all the engineering 
that went into this vehicle, all the blood, sweat, and tears that it took to make this uh, like achievement for humanity possible, and that I could be there skimming across the surface of the earth at these ludicrous speeds, listening to a little fan running, <laughs> and that's it. Totally quiet, peaceful, floating. If people wanted to track the research that you did, is that available? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And what were those? The, you did like five experiments? Oh, I did hundreds. Oh, I thought there was five main categories that were taking place. Like one was a, I can't remember right now, but. I, I literally worked on hundreds of different experiments. Some of them are on myself, so I'm the test subject. Yeah. Uh, I got pretty good at drawing my own blood. I was going to say, yeah. I did a lot of phlebotomy. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of like just samples and, um, and then a lot of it is, you know, in a glove box working on an experiment that got flown up there mm. where I'm not. Okay. The got subject, it. But, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. And cool. so there's, um, I believe it's called the, um, space station research explorer. There's, there's actually an app you can download, uh, mm. that, um, has details about all sorts of the, uh, about all the research projects going on right now. Um, there's there's so much cool stuff. We printed a meniscus up there. We printed a three D printer a, of a, a of a knee section of human meniscus. Yeah, we printed it. It's the first meniscus printed in space. That's, that's pretty oh cool. My God, what, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Yeah. In a statement, thank you, one for including me in the way that you did, not only in this series and the eloquence in which you've brought me and us into your experience and the insights and best practices, like thank you for it. And then also thank you for creating something that my son and I got to experience. Um, you invited us to launch and uh, even though it was scrubbed with like two minutes ago, it is a great story for my son and I. We get to laugh about you know the whole thing, but more importantly, we were there to support you. I felt honored to do that. And um, you created a memory for my son and I that will forever or will will last our lifetime. And so thank you for creating that that very special experience with my son and I. And thank you for including me in the way that you have. Excited about your future and honored to to have a glimpse into how you operate. And I feel better about humanity with you in it. <laughs> so and I mean that. Um, so like, do you have any grand messages or any thoughts that you wish that people could maybe better understand or a message that you'd like to give to um, us? You know what I've been thinking a bit, a bit about lately mm -hmm. as I look back on just, I don't know, arc of life. And I've been thinking that it's really useful to shorten your time horizon. I just have spent, I think it's, it's a natural to feel like you should have a plan one of the most common questions I get when I go out and talk about like life as an astronaut, most common question probably is, did you always want to be an astronaut? And I think a lot about that question because um, in the easy answer is yes, <laughs> I did. I thought it would be really cool. But also I think implicit in that question is, did you have a plan? Like what was the how did you do that? Or what was, you must have had a plan for how to do that. I had no such thing. Absolutely not. Far from it. In that, I feel like it's really tempting to think that we need to have a, a long-term plan. Where am I going? What is my long-term vision? And then deconstruct that down into the steps to get there. But more and more, I just feel like that's actually a false narrative. More and more, I feel like all I've got is the next little bit and that I actually can stop worrying about the long term. And if I just focus on the next little bit, shorten the time horizon, that has actually been liberating and uh, I think helped me. I think it helped me early in life. And then I think it helped me even on my mission, just focusing on the day or the task I'm doing and nothing else and not worrying about the long-term plan. So I love the answer and, um, you wouldn't know this, but we did a analysis about four years ago on, uh, I think we, we had a subset of 50 masters of craft on the podcast that we selected, um, with some selection criteria randomly in the sense that 
we didn't know what they were going to say in total, but we had some site criteria of who we're going to select to study. And we ran them through a natural language processor, which now seems like we're like really early and it costs a lot of money to do it now. Like you flip it over to GPT and it'll tell you exactly what it says. So we did this about five years ago. And what we came to, what we found, one of the findings was that the 50 masters of crafts that went through this mini experiment from our transcripts and conversations is that they don't set goals, oddly enough. Yep. So they were more interested in experiences and they're not like fun, da, 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 but they're more interested in like adjusting their daily activities to meet this thing that they wanted to understand better. And it wasn't like I had a long-term 10 year of this and I had a 25 year vision or a goal of this. I'm not saying that they didn't have goals for a day relative to a task, but so that idea of shorten the time horizon was something that um, didn't show up, but the idea about goal setting was a really interesting finding. So, yeah. um, I think maybe it doesn't work for an organization, but I think at the individual level, shortening your personal time horizon for your planning, just worrying about the immediate next thing and not worrying about what's way off in the future is super valuable. Maybe for an or it's good for organizations to set big goals. And this is a good chance as we finish up here, uh, I should certainly plug, I'm super excited because we are going to the moon. How about so it? So that's an example of a bold, audacious goal. I'm Art, so Art, glad our Artemis. country mm -hmm. has committed with yes. Artemis. Mm -hmm. We're going to send uh, crews back to the moon. We haven't been for fif over 50 years since Apollo. And we're going to go set up a permanent presence on the moon. So that's some, I'm glad we have that goal. Uh, and we're, d we're doing it. Right. The Artemis II crew has been named. They're in training right now. Um, their date just got adjusted, but they'll be flying in September of 2025. And uh, about a year after that, we're planning on that first moon landing since Apollo. So do you have I'm hopes to get excited. back to, to go to the moon? I would. Well, I talked about setting expectations low earlier, yeah, right? Right. so I have to live that. But um, I'm excited for anyone to go to the moon. Yeah, like, that's cool. That's, yeah. yeah, but that's you would be really in the mix, exciting. maybe. Uh, yeah, I think I, everyone in the astronaut office is in the yeah. mix. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so you're confirming this is not shot in a, a Hollywood studio. I am confirming that I went to space. It was amazing. <laughs> and you're confirming I, that I, the Artemis project is also not in a Hollywood studio. Correct. That we're we're actually going we're to the actually moon. going to the moon. It's yeah. really hard. Um, you probably heard, but the um, there's a little company out of Pittsburgh that built a lunar lander through something called the CLIPS program. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sad to say it, the. That they're not going to be able to land on the moon. They had a, some setbacks. They oh, had this nice was the one that just happened. Yeah, the Peregrine yeah, landing, yeah. Um, the lander. Um, they had a fuel leak, and um, they don't have the fuel to to land on the moon. And my point there is just, you know, we're rooting them on. That mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be failures along the way, and these are these clips missions this, this are meant to be you, but, fairly, uh, you know, on the the lower cost side, but but sending some precursor robotic missions out to the moon before the people, um, and we're doing it with commercial partners. And uh, it's an, I think it's an innovative approach that NASA's taking there. And we're gonna see failures because it's, it's hard. <laughs> Putting stuff on the moon is not easy. It is, um, low Earth orbit is 240 miles away. The moon is 225,000 miles away. Whoa, do that again? It's the so it's a thousand times further away than, than I was. Thousand I, times yeah, that, I, from Earth. It's, yeah, it's I didn't really have that math. Far. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. Last question. Last, last, last question. <laughs> um, uh, how many aliens did you see? Zero. Oh, okay. Are you sure? It was actually pretty quick. Yeah. You know, like, I, I don't know. Like, it's a lot of buzz about aliens right now. It would, it would make my life so much more complicated if I had seen something. I would be so confused. Yeah, but uh, no. Nope. Right. As a applied scientist, as an astronaut, w are there aliens? Oh, I think. Are there UFOs? Are there UAPs? Yeah. So, um, I mean, you're probably familiar with the Drake equation, but uh, I'm, I'm I think it's, it's, it's an interesting oh, the Drake equation, meaning that, um, of course there must be, of course there must be it's in some sense. Yes. So it, it's useful to spend some time with the Drake equation and at least just understanding the philosophical argument that it's making. And it's essentially just a product of a bunch of probabilities. And all that the Drake equation is saying is, is essentially it's saying there's a lot out there. And so, we don't know what the probability of forming life on a, another planet is given certain conditions. I mean, all we have is uh, Earth 
and maybe some uh, near Earth neighboring solar systems to study. But the vast majority of the solar system we're unable to view at the scale of like planets. So we just don't know what's out there. Uh, but we can kind of look at the numbers and realize that there's certainly lots of places where it's possible that the conditions to support life could exist. So it is, of course, reasonable to conclude that there might be other life out there. Yeah. And it's probably the greatest question in human existence, in, in or the greatest question for humanity, I think, is are there other um civilizations out there are there other forms of intelligent life out there it's, it's fascinating it is fascinating yeah yeah and if you're gonna bet on it you fall on the idea that yeah probably the, the drake equation would lead you to believe or lead you to think I, I think it's uh yeah it's it's really hard for me to put a number on it but yeah i think it it says that there's a substantial chance that there could be other intelligent life out there. It is, but I, it doesn't say that it's definitely. And it also, I mean, the other thing to real, realize about the universe is that the distances are vast. And as far as we know, we can't travel faster than the speed of light. So that sets a fundamental limit on. For us, maybe not them. Yeah, I can't answer that question. But as far as we know, we can't move information, let alone ourselves faster than this fundamental speed limit and the distances are vast our cl the closest star to earth is four light years away so if if you somehow could go at the speed of light you could go to that closest star in four years and so you know the idea of going to and visit we can't some, travel the speed not right. even close to we can't travel a tenth of the speed of light not right. even close yeah so really so, it would be a li human lifetime. Yeah, like I was right. going to say like 75 years. Right. So you so not I don't I hope that's not depressing, but that says that no, just even mean, if yeah. even if there's stuff out there, it may be that we are so far away that we just can't uh, establish contact. I had a thought when I was um, probably 9 years old. Maybe 8. And I was certain that at some point I'm going to be able to walk through walls. <laughs> and um oddly enough um i asked my wife that question like you ever had that thought like we're married like 10 years and you know like you ever had that thought and she goes oh, i did too I go, what she goes yeah i figured that like i'm matter that's matter if i could time it up just the right way like you know there's like i think i could finally figure that thing out sometime like this is the magical mind of an eight or nine year old I'm still kind of betting that one day if we got the math just right, the timing, because there's more non-space than space, or there's yeah. more what, what matter, non-matter than matter, right? Yeah, atoms atoms are mostly void. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know, it's a little magical thinking, but yeah, you start to play with those quantum yep. you know, <laughs> experiments, it's like pretty radical. Yeah. So anyways, well, listen, if, yeah, yeah, oh, please. Yeah. If you look at the vast arc of human history, right, it was only what two or three, a couple hundred, it was a few hundred years ago that we, that human beings figured out that the earth revolves around the sun. Is that and Copernicus? Th this is like, we have, uh, I, th I think you're right. It was, I think it was Galileo Copernicus. was involved too, right? But yeah. Maybe, yeah. And, and I think they were also persecuted. Correct. Uh, right. They, Correct. I, I think they had they had to buy, they had to go into exile or persecuted or like this was a they minority were, they were killed view by the, the the Catholic or Christian Church by saying, "What are you talking about? Like you're going against our principles." Right. This was a minority view. So I I mean I think you can learn from that. It's important to allow minority views to be expressed. Oh, that's a cool way to frame that. Yep. Yeah. And also, we probably don't know everything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. We, <laughs> it wasn't long ago that we were still two hundred years basic ago. Stuff and out. in psychology, yeah. <laughs> it was not that. I, I don't know the exact date. I'll say a hundred. I'm gonna hysteria. Hysteria. When, when a woman was hysterical, it was because her womb oh. her, her, was wandering in her body. I mean, yeah. How far off was thinking? Call off. it a hundred years ago. Right. Right. Like radically wrong. Right. Yeah. And so um, that's why we call it hysterectomy because the the hysteria that would take place from the wandering womb wow what 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 did what? i just say like that is you know that was the best we could do 
early days, you know, to, I don't know. So anyways, not to get uh, down that yeah. rabbit hole, but like, look, I really appreciate you. This is awesome. Thank Can't you. Can't wait to know what you're going to be up to next. And you have a home here at the Mastery Lab. Uh, um, and I'll give you the key. Uh, I'll, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It's always such an honor and a pleasure to get to talk with you. You always bring out the most insightful and interesting questions. And so um, just thanks. Thanks for the wonderful experience. Appreciate you. You want to put a dinner on aliens? What does that mean? Bet a dinner. Oh, within our lifetime. Are we going to find out? This is a, this is a, year, a, a, a lifetime. Bet. Which side of this bet do you want? Uh, that we, we are not going to know in our lifetime, but that maybe our kids might know. I agree with you. There you go. So. Well, on the second I don't think part, we'll know. the I don't, kids. I don't think we'll know in our lifetimes. As but far our kids. Uh, I don't know. Cool. Yeah. Appreciate you. You too.